I have received the <coughs> whole list of questions. Uh, one question, <coughs> perhaps we may not have more than I mean, time to answer more than one question. Uh, one question I like to answer is this. Satipatthana Sutta, does one need to practice all the 14 mindful ex mindfulness exercise? If so, in what order? Does path and fruition depend on mastering each of these? Actually, when you look at it, uh, it as we uh, explain it, uh, sometimes people uh, uh, may think that they have to practice all of them. But uh, uh, it is just to give the whole suit, the whole uh, 14 aspects are there, to explain the meditation techniques, system, how to become mindful, uh, what involved in mindfulness training, and how many uh, subjects and how to do that. But uh, in practice, uh, if you are doing uh, very uh, diligently, mindfully, even one of them is enough. Out of all these 14, one of them enough. You may start with any of them, from the Dhamma Nupasana, uh, as we have already discussed uh, hindrances, if you take hindrances as an object of meditation, you keep practicing that, you can see everything else is uh, uh, involved in that practice, mindfulness of hindrances. Uh, let me um, uh, quote from the Sutta itself. Sutta says, Santang ajyattam kama chandang atime ajyattam kama chandoti pajanati asantang ajyattam kama chandan natime ajyattam kama chandoti pajanati yathasya anupannasa kama chandasa upado hodi tancha pajanati yathasya upannasa kama chandasa pahinam hodi tancha pajanati uh, this is for one of the five hindrances. Yatāja pahina sa kāma chanda āyatiṁ anuppādo hoti tancha pajānāti. That means <coughs> when the first of the five hindrances, like greed, when one uh, my practicing my mindfulness uh, notice that greed is in oneself, in one's own mind. Then at that moment, you become aware of it, become mindful of it, mindful of greed. As uh, we mentioned, when you become mindful of greed, perhaps by pure mindfulness, pure attention, pure awareness, that greed will not grow it will leave the mind. It is just like you are catching a thief in the broad daylight. When you catch a thief, when, you, when the thief is coming, if, you, if the thief sees you watching him, he will not advance. He would slowly withdraw, go away. Similarly, becoming aware, mindful, of the presence of greed in your mind, greed will not increase, it disappears. However, if your mindfulness is not strong enough, greed may stay, stay in your mind, then you use one of those methods or all these methods to get rid of them. When, when it is gone, disappeared, 
you become aware of the fact that that particular hindrance, that greed is gone, disappeared for that time. Then, uh, after a while, you realize that desire is not coming back again. So mind is temporarily free from desire. Similarly, when uh, greed or other hindrance arise, you do the same thing. Then what happens? By mindfully watching this process, you realize another important factor, that is the true mindfulness arising out of this exercise. What is the mindfulness arising out of this exercise? Is that which is arisen is subject to passing away. That is uh, seeing impermanence. This is what is called yang kinchi samudaya dhammang sabbantang nirodha dhammang. Any dhamma, any state that is subject to arising is subject to passing away. You see impermanence. Practicing impermanence is one of the most important cardinal factors of mindfulness practice. Knowing, realizing, understanding, seeing impermanence is very important thing. So you saw impermanence there. When any of these hindrances is present, you know it is not satisfactory. Uh, mind is taught temporarily free from them and it came back. So you see all this impermanent ple joy, pleasure that you have when the hindrance left the mind, you rejoice it, you are happy. But that happiness is not permanent because hindrance will, can come back again another time. So you see that which is impermanent is not satisfactory. And when this happens, you also realize that it happens both appearing and disappearing, becoming dissatisfactory, unsatisfactory, all happens almost automatically. Everything is sort of automated. Then you realize that you have no control. When you realize that there is no control over any of these things, you realize that there is no self. So you can see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and selflessness in this exercise, in this practice. Then, <coughs> at the end of that section, you will also read, iti ajyattang va dhamme su dhamma anupasi veriti, bahidha va dhamme su dhamma anupasi veriti, ajyatta bahidha va dhamme su dhamma anupasi veriti, samudha dhamma anupasi va dhamme su veriti, vay dhamma anupasi va dhamme su veriti, samudha vay dhamma anupasi va dhamme su veriti. <coughs> then you will see the way how dhamma arises. This is a particular dhamma at that time, this hindrance, how it arises. And you will see how it passes away. Then you see one time you saw how it arises, another time you saw how it passes away. Then you will see both arising and passing away. <coughs> And you will see that happens to you within yourself. Then you also gain knowledge, insight, understanding into the fact, the way, how it happens to you. And then you will realize when you think of any other person, any their uh, rising of hindrances, passing away hindrances, is exactly like yours. In this way, you understand the nature of hindrances arising and passing away is universal, not only particular to you, but it is. it happens to everybody exactly the way it happened to you. It passes away the same way in other people <coughs> as it passed away in you. <coughs> then, another insight you see, you realize, Atti dhamma ati vapana sa sati pachu patita hoti yavadeva jnana mattaya pati sati mattaya anisito ch viharati nachakin julyog yupati. That is the last insight you gain. <coughs> that is, 
this particular dhamma, this particular phenomenon, this particular events happens this way, it is there, it is happening, and it is happening, it is there only for me to gain knowledge and insight. Knowledge is that it is arising and passing away, insight that it is impermanent, that it is uh, uh, without self, that it is subject to suffering, the whole operation is subject to suffering. And therefore, when it passes away, when it disappears, the state that you experience uh, is pleasant, is wholesome, peaceful, and yet that is not there for you to cling to. Because pleasant, when uh, unpleasant mental state, unpleasant dhamma disappears, pleasant dhamma arises, pleasant dhamma is just the opposite of hindrances as you all mentioned. When they arise, for instance, when greed disappears, you feel freedom of uh, slavery or freedom of uh, indebtedness. When hatred disappears, uh, you feel friendliness, you feel freedom of uh, sickness and so forth. That is so attractive, so pleasant, so you may cling to it. But the Sutta says, but this occurrence happens and it happens that way and you, it, is, it is happening not for you to cling to it. You should not cling to that state. And realize, well, now it is peaceful, and this peaceful state is there not for me to cling to it. It is just the nature of this peaceful state. So, <coughs> Dhamma exists there for me to gain knowledge and insight, but not to cling to. This is the theme you see in every aspect of these 14 steps of uh, mindfulness training, whether it is posture, whether it is breath, or parts of the body, elements, anything. Channel ground meditation also. Also, it's a good way of familiarizing the people. Sure, sure. Channel ground meditation is uh, particularly good for people who are very much attached to the body. <coughs> to see uh, the impermanence in uh, visible, tangible, more. Isn't that an external object that happens? All the others are internal objects. Now, one thing that uh, cemetery meditation uh, is an external object, you focus your mind, learn, understand what happens to a dead body, and then you compare your body with that body. Then it is said, evang uh, dhammo, evang bhavi etang anati toti, this happens to me, this body, and this body is not gone beyond that nature that happens to the external body. So, uh, that is visible impermanence of body. Normally people have all kind of wrong views with regard to their own bodies. <coughs> but when you really mindfully watch what is really happening to a body, until it turns to dust and, you know, blown away by wind, then you will realize that is exactly what happens to my body. This so-called my body is not immune to that. So therefore, that also is a very good subject of meditation. So any of these 14 steps. Why 14? Why so many? Actually, there are more than 14 if you look at them more carefully. Why so many? Because 
people's mentality is so different. Different people need different objects of meditation. And Buddha gave the whole spectrum of meditation subjects in that one discourse for you to choose whatever you want. If somebody wants to practice all of them, well and good, go ahead and practice all of them. At least one of them will work for you. If not, choose. Most people use only breathing. Whether they like it or not, they simply stay with the breath. And sometimes people complain. They keep complaining um, for not making any progress and so forth and so on. Instead of uh, choosing another subject and try. Try out one. If that doesn't work, try out another. If that doesn't work, try out. Until you find your own your, the suitable object, suitable part of the four foundations of mindfulness for your own mental state. Because in each practice, there will be the same thing. You see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness. You see they are there for you to gain uh, knowledge and insight and uh, so forth. So, uh, I think that is enough for uh, questions. If you have further questions on this answer, I would like to spend a few minutes. Otherwise, <coughs> we can conclude today's program.